Mesdames et Messieurs, nous allons donc parler des... Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about medical deserts. And this is a, a regular subject of discussion. It keeps coming back because uh, we uh, could go back to uh, Jericho in the beginning of the Neolithic time when there were t the population of 10,000 and in 1770 BC and Babylon had 7,000. And um, if you look at the population today living in cities, we're 4 billion people. 55% of uh, uh, men and women in the world today are living in cities. And deserts are not necessarily deserts in rural areas. They're also in urban areas and city centers. And uh, politicians, at least in our countries and in other countries, as we've seen with the experience which has been uh, presented to us, we can see that we've had this problem everywhere. I discussed it with uh, Professor Enbai just before she gave her presentation. And I said, it's absolutely incredible when you think that uh, We've got resources, and we have money, and we don't use it. And you have neither uh, the money nor the resources, and you manage to get all the right elements needed for uh, medical care. And when you look at policies and uh, so on, from we had um, uh, we had from the French Revolution on, uh, and in time of uh, Bonaparte and First Consul, uh, we had uh, the first uh, the practice of uh, medical practitioners, and um, and in 1800s there were 10,000 doctors in France for 30 million. Now there are 226,000 for only twice the population population and it's not working, so we should be asking questions about this. What should we say about the causes of this? And then what uh, resources are needed so that we can reorganize what we could call the medical business so that uh, people can have access to health care as quickly as possible for the best quality health care for both prevention and care. I'm going to ask the members of the round table to introduce themselves. So, I'm Pierre Merle. I'm a general practitioner and I'm in Lozère and I've been there for more than 35 years now. And for the discussion today, I'm going to be talking about telemedicine, which I practice with the Nîmes University Hospital, and I have been doing that for some 10 years now. I'm Dr. Patrick Boyle. I'm a general practitioner in St. Saint-Denis in the north of Paris, and uh, I am a president of the uh, French uh, medical practitioners body, which uh, covers all the medical practitioners in France. And I think we're looking at the question of training and what we want to do with the doctors we are training. I think this is a basic question that we need to deal with so that we can move ahead. Hello, I'm Frank Bodino. I'm a doctor, and I set up a company uh, a few years ago called H4Ds, and it's on. Um, I invented the first connected medical practices, and we have a whole healthcare itinerary, and we work with uh, local uh, doctors and practitioners so that we can be a brick uh, providing an answer to the question and the problem of Bonjour, medical deserts. I am Guillaume de Durand. I am not a doctor, I'm a patient. And I come from rural area of France, and I'm very interested in e-health. And I have seen that my area is a digital desert. And we've seen all the expansion of e-health, which goes from telemedicine to connected networks. And we can't do it if we have digital deserts. And we must be connected. So I set up a, a summer school on um, what we call medical and digital de deserts. It's sort of a uh, double um, problem that we have. I'm Jean-Louis Touraine. I'm a, a, medicine, a, a medical practitioner in Lyon, and I am a member of Parliament and a member of the committee trying to solve the problem of medical deserts. And as we've just heard, medical deserts are also often digital deserts, and sometimes they're just plain deserts for all types of public services. And the solution is probably to extend efforts uh, so that we can have more first practitioners, both general practitioners and specialists, and also the other services that need to go hand in hand with that public service. 
So now the first subject as a good doctor, I'd say, is the diagnosis. So what are the main causes? And here I would like to ask the Member of Parliament and the President of the, uh, the French Doctors Association professional body what their diagnosis of the situation is. Well, there are many causes. If we look back in history, you'll see there have often been medical deserts and sometimes in areas which have become even more deserts. The situation has got worse with urban development and some rural areas have been left without any help. And sometimes there just hasn't been the right sort of demographic growth in the doctors. Uh, we may have enough at the moment, but we won't have as many doctors in the future. And we've got the system of a quota in France, which hasn't kept up. And for um, young medical practitioners, they mustn't just uh, be nostalgic and look at old practices. Uh, you can see that uh, young men and women who are doctors don't want to be the single uh, country doctor. They like to work in groups. They like to have timetables which are clear. They want to have a proper balance between their professional life and their private life. And so all the organization needs to be set up with uh, the uh, situation. And we've really lagged behind and We haven't kept up with that development in society. I'd look even further and say, well, what explains this situation of medical deserts? Well, probably because in France we've built the healthcare system on the basis of uh, hospitals or clinics in the, uh, whatever the healthcare facility is. And all the rationale of the healthcare system in France has been built around the, the clinics and hospitals and facilities and building them up. And we have haven't actually looked at what is required for the structural access to healthcare, which is diversity and local services. And we're learning about it now, and it's a harsh awakening because we've focused all our efforts on the the physical infrastructure, and this is not in line with what's required for diversity and uh, local services. And so we need to look at this in relation to the question of why we're training uh, doctors. Now, you referred back to the city of Jericho, but we have to realize that uh, new, uh, the new technology might be the trumpets of Jericho. In other words, they will bring down the walls uh, built around uh, hospitals, clinics, and healthcare facilities, and perhaps we'll open up a model of providing close range services and uh, in line with capacities. Now, what I'm interested in is that you're able to delegate and use all the tools in the modern world, whereas in France, we stay in a set system where we have got, uh, we've got nurses who are allowed to do a certain number of things. They're not allowed to do everything. And then, contrary to what uh, uh, Jean-Louis Touraine says, I think we need fewer doctors and more people with a, with a, a bachelor's or master's degree and who don't need to study for 12 years to provide some of the basic care. What do you think? Yes, we need to reinvent uh, the whole idea of what uh, medical practice is, and we need to uh, change things. We haven't uh, moved ahead quickly with uh, uh, progress and new practices. Of course, there, there were healthcare officials at the time of Napoleon, and they invented um, Mr. Bovary uh, figures, and we can see what the shortcomings were there. But OK, you could uh, relieve doctors of a number of tasks that don't require 12 years' study, and you could have uh, uh, different levels of nurses and other healthcare professionals who could do that. But if you transfer those delegations to other healthcare professionals, you, you need to look at all the bureaucratic work that could be done by others, too, because uh, uh, French general practitioners do less uh, uh, work or less patients uh, than a German one, and it's not necessarily because they work less, but because they spend too much time doing paperwork and bureaucratic work, and they haven't been relieved of that, and that should be relieved to people who are experts in that type of work. And I would like to point out the doctors of the future uh, won't necessarily need to be there in greater numbers if we can have more efficient organizations so that they're not spending their time on non-medical tasks. And 
No. If you have uh, staff who are not doctors, did that create a problem with doctors in, in the, your area? What's called a family health uh, strategy. The family health strategy team is typically formed by a medical doctor, a nurse, a technical nurse, and six, five to seven uh, community health workers. And there is a... a the, the work is shared in, inside this team. There is a support from a psychologist, a physiotherapist, from, from a group of uh, every five or six uh, family health strategy teams can ha have support from other, other, other professionals. We are trying to, to, to have a more well-divided role of these persons, and, uh, but there are some we still have some legal considerations. And until recent, for example, this community health worker was not allowed to measure the blood pressure. So only recently that it was uh, allowed for them. It was, for me, is, uh, un but now you can go to a pharmacy and buy uh, an equipment and measure automatically the, the blood pressure. So uh, there is some delay on, on the legislation about this, but there is now the, the, the role of the nurse in this primary health care team is very, very important. It's the person who... Our, our uh, primary health care team has a territory and they have a map, you can go to the units, and you see the persons, the pregnant women are marked, the hypertensive, the di diabetic, those with mental, uh, mental disease. So, at, at, and the, the nurse is the main responsible for taking care of, of this. Uh, so I think that we should think for medical desserts, uh, in, uh, think a lot about task shifting, about the sharing the activities in a health team a more integrated. And I think that I'm sure that this is a solution for a developing country in Brazil, but it probably could be a solution also for other, other settings. Mm -hmm. Nous n'avons jamais été si nombreux puisque en 83 il y avait Well, there were so many of us because in 1983 there were 13,000 uh, hospital doctors, another 45,000. We've got 8,000 8, new ones every 10 years, and it's still absolute chaos. Uh, sorry to say that it's unbelievable to see the chaotic organization and the lousy prospects we have in the medium term. What do you think of that, Pierre? Well, I have an idea. Well, you wanted a, a diagnosis, Mr. Venancien. Well, what happens to the students once they get to the end of their studies? If you take 100 students, uh, 30% who do nothing more than locum work, or, and there are 40% who want to be on a salary, and 10% uh, uh, just disappear. They, they want to have a salary position because they don't want to have to set up in private practice and devote all their time to, to, the, to work and not to families. And because uh, we now have more and more women doctors, 60%, they don't want to uh, spend uh, uh, huge numbers of hours working. Uh, every, they want to get closer to a 35-hour working week. No. In 2010, we set up the role of a coordinating a, a, a doctor for elderly people. These are positions of coordinators uh, which are taken by a number of uh, students. Uh, they don't have to provide health care, and they become um, administrators. That's all they do. And those positions were uh, set up. And I think it's the government that really uh, uh, defeated its own purpose by uh, setting up these positions and stopping uh, young people go off and providing medical care. And so we've lost those doctors. I can see in the Lose region where I live, which is a, a desert area, and you can see that uh, there are uh, doctors who get up to around uh, the age of 50 and they just become coordinators. They stop providing health care, and I've had a number of such cases in my area. And we used to be three doctors in my area. And the, the one wanted to become a coordinating doctor as of 2010, and I would ask uh, if this is a logical way of doing it. Do you think it's a good idea to spend 10 uh, years studying and then just become a, an administrator, do nothing more than that, uh, just to uh, uh, sit uh, sit down and uh, deal with paperwork and tables and things? Uh, and uh, when you talk about uh, nurses and delegating tasks, well, that's one way of dealing with it. But I, I don't think we 
should uh, be in a situation where we're stopping um, uh, doctors from uh, providing medical care. And, they, and you've got to look at the question of 35-hour working week, too. And I think we haven't really spent much time talking about these coordinating doctors. Uh, Guillaume de Durand. Oh, the first question about uh, the attractiveness of uh, the position as a doctor, that's something that I have seen in the rural area of where I am. And what we hear from the local uh, agencies and authorities that uh, want to work in healthcare centers, they build them, but they end up with them being empty. And they criticized the role of the national media because they give a very poor image of what's happening in the provinces. And um, it was interesting and uh, I've seen that this is one of the arguments that's put forth, the, the negative uh, role of the media. And then there are nurses who have um, telemedical training, but they cannot practice as nurses. They cannot practice telemedicine. And then the, in, uh, in different uh, regions, what we see is that, uh, well, the system has changed. OK, I'm, I'm a doctor, and people think I'm important. And they say, you're, you're a nurse, and you're not you're are not important, um, and um, it's um, uh, and I can tell you as a patient, I've had my life saved by as many doctors as uh, as nurses, or as many nurses as doctors. What is the real demand uh, for the for, uh, doctors? Um, well, first of all, the patients. That's for uh, doctors providing telemedicine. Well, the first you've got the patients who want it, they, and so the first people we're talking to are the patients. So who actually contracts us with the uh, network that we have uh, covering the, the country and the areas we provide with telemedical services? Well, basically, the patient uh, groups, patient associations, or members of local government, because they're up against uh, these challenges, uh, they have to answer questions asked by patients, or they have to deal with patients who call at the weekend or at night when there's no healthcare professionals. And then, of course, there's a the question of local authorities and regional authorities who have to step in. But what you need to understand is that uh, uh, telemedicine is just one way of answering uh, the requirements for health care. It's just one brick in the wall. I'd like to come back to what was said earlier. I would say there are some positions that could be given back to doctors. I'm sure that's the case. But there are also new expectations from the health care professionals. And we see this uh, every day. Now, there are lots of doctors and we realize, well, you may think this is funny. Uh, you'll see that some uh, uh, healthcare professionals are put back to work and they're told that they have to work in a way which they're not used to working in. But what we are asking for the doctors working in the network we're setting up is that they should keep on with their uh, traditional practice, be it private practice or in hospital. Uh, but we see a lot of women, and the, but this will be the case of men too, who are pleased to be able to start at set time and stop at a set time and to have set to periods of consultation. Uh, companies interested in these um, uh, in these services, which means that they can send their employees off to have a test without ha necessarily having to leave their work site or, or, take a, or make an appointment. Well, here we're going to talk about a business model. Well, if you have a telephone consultation with a doctor, there was a study which was done with the NHS on this, and they can only answer, say, 3% of medical requirements, and all the rest of it is just uh, referring um, uh, patients. And in our telemedical consultation service, the remote doctor can do 80% of uh, what is usually done on the 272 most common conditions encountered. And why? And that is because for the six years we went through all all the uh, medical references, and we train the doctors to deal with them. So that's an important point to note. So the patient is going to have a, a doctor uh, through video connection who will provide health care, and then you can deal with general uh, practitioners' uh, scope of work and also specialist scope. And we're of interest to companies, to private companies, because there is a business model. There was a, there was a set of payment which was made to doctors, uh, depending 
depending on the service provided. And now we can see that this type of model might be used to meet the needs in these medical deserts because they will be paid and the social security system will cover this as of September. We get some two or three calls a day from local authorities who want to uh, avail themselves of our services and we can't uh, respond to their requests because we don't have an, a viable business model. When I think that in 2004, Philippe Doustablazzi, who was minister at the time, uh, uh, launched the shared uh, medical record system and uh, said we'd have um, you know, a huge increase in them uh, within a couple of years. And I was in a, a rural area and I saw the person in charge of medical insurance and their public and uh, social security system. And uh, 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 you've got to see it in relation to the population and the, uh, the different uh, regions and divisions that we have in France with the département and so on. And we've got a huge technocratic approach. And, and when you think that all the technology is there and that we can get what we need, but we can't get past it, I'd say, where's the political will required? What political resources are available so that we can really get the players uh, doing taking action. Perhaps the MP can answer this. Well, of course, we know that it's the uh, public uh, health authority that decides on what's uh, covered by social security, which uh, is of key importance in any decisions made, and we're really running behind. And we know that uh, some systems have worked in certain regions, and we can hope that things will spread to others. Of course, we can regret that we've been lagging behind, but uh, we're going to try and catch up on the time and also we need to catch up on uh, technological facilities needed with digital coverage, which must be provided very quickly. I think we can be optimistic about this, but we really uh, have been pe penalized in some parts of the country in this and in some of the ways of working, which uh, meant that things became excessively slow and lagged behind in some areas. And I agree with you. I don't think there's any uh, reason for accepting this uh, uh, situation, which has been going on for some 12 years now. And we really need to have the shared medical files uh, so that they can be available via, via uh, digital technology. And we need to have development of uh, telemedicine and uh, these facilities in desert areas. And, and also, we need to have this access for hospital uh, uh, staff we need to encourage this by having proper training of the different healthcare professionals. We need to have financial support for setting up the facilities needed, and we need to have proper dialogue. We need to have dialogue between the different entities, which are not always compatible, and uh, which, um, uh, because they're not compatible, cause difficulties and make things go slowly. But I agree that the 21st century cannot uh, uh, put up with this situation going on as it is, and we're going to make up for this uh, uh, soon. Okay, we won't be able to solve all the difficulties involved in this medical desert situation, but we will find a key way of moving ahead so that the entire population, both uh, healthcare professionals and patients, can move ahead to these new practices. In the past, the facilities and um, tools were not available and people were reluctant to adopt them. There were, there were traditions and practices which meant there was there was a cultural reluctance, and in some uh, villages, people would say, okay, you're talking about telemedicine and new tools, but I'm used to having direct contact with the doctor, and I want to have a doctor in my village. But in the future, people living in villages will be used to working this way. They know that if they have chronic condition, they'll be able to have effective monitoring thanks to the, this modern technology. And when they need to have a, a direct uh, contact, then the patient will agree to go off uh, 20 kilometers away to a multi a disciplinary healthcare center or to a group of practice where they will find a number of specialists. Uh, I'm an ardent uh, uh, advocate uh, for the shared medical um, records and have been for a long time. And I think we need to see that uh, you have to work out the right balance between inpatients, outpatients, uh, urban and rural services. And of, of course, when you look at uh, the uh, the um, 
title that we've chosen here for our discussion, we're talking about um, how we can reduce resistance. So there is resistance. Uh, and the problem in France is that we may have obstacles which are dogmatic, or perhaps they come from the doctors themselves and their professional body. And we've got uh, new stakeholders in the healthcare world, and perhaps they came in fairly clumsy with saying that they wanted to do e-health, whereas uh, health was considered uh, to be the domain of uh, specialists. And so this created a, a certain tension and this didn't help us move ahead. So we don't uh, do what, what other countries have done where they've managed to move ahead without uh, this prejudice uh, and they've wanted to build something. In France, we've got a layer of regulation that it's difficult to get through and we don't have the right nomenclature and uh, so on. And then we've got to uh, uh, get through other administrative obstacles, whereas there is innovation. There are lots of startups. You, you can go up to Las Vegas and see the French people can presenting their startups. When you come back to France, there's not much support and aid for them. So I think we need to have changes there. We need to do this in the uh, in the healthcare centers and facilities and and. Um, so we need to uh, see what uh, is happening. We've got uh, things on an experimental basis, um, uh, but we need to do it in a structured way. You might even wonder if there is really an ambition to move ahead. Patrick? Well, perhaps I can uh, perhaps uh, uh, really try and uh, uh, destroy some of the traditions here, which perhaps is not right uh, for my position. But where is the obstacle now? Where are the where is the resistance? I would say that it's on the political side. But I'd say we all have responsibilities, not just the politicians. What model does the political world today really want to have for access to health care throughout France? Instead of just sitting here lamenting the situation, we need to see the ambition and daring and innovation that's required. And in the end, I would say that for the past 30 years, the, the political world has been hiding behind this desperate bid of maintaining what we have achieved over the previous uh, 30 years. Whereas uh, today we need to have a violent approach, I would say. We need to have major capital expenditure. And this capital expenditure will come from financial resources, and we also need to have human expenditure and technological expenditure. And we sit back and keep saying that healthcare is expensive, and we haven't looked at the cost of healthcare. And this has really stopped us having any imaginative ideas on the subject. The second point is that when you look at training, when you look at universities today, they have to understand that they have responsibility for the country and for structuring the whole services. And again, we've got resistance that need to be removed. And we need to go over the obstacles so that we get practitioners who can carry out their uh, work. We're not just training trainers who will uh, make the whole system go on uh, um, forever. And we need to have courage at the, at the university level. And it needs to be a focus for effort, this, this courage. And uh, I'm prepared to put up with criticism for my uh, body of uh, doctors. We need to accept criticism, but we have to see that healthcare professionals, all those who are involved in healthcare, be they doctors, nurses, or whatever, they all need to understand two things. First is that skills are to be shared, and they are to be shared to achieve a goal. And we have to stop setting boundaries where we sit on one side and look at others on the other side as if they were enemies. We have to have goals, shared goals, and we have to share our skills and expertise. And we've got to stop talking about delegating uh, um, tasks and uh, and skills. We have to share our skills so that we can achieve the goal that we share. 
okay, and then we'll be able to get a different uh, uh, argument and different policy because we're always a bit um, reluctant to, to go beyond the boundaries because if we talk about delegating tasks, then we think people are trying to, uh, to encroach on our areas and we must have different way of making our arguments heard. We need to have political daring and courage. We need to have new arguments. We need to have positive argument on investments that required. And there's another form of courage, which is between the different professionals. And we need to see that the different levels of professional practice and expertise must share the same objective. And this can be involved with the fourth situation, and that is with awareness that is needed because we can, we need to look closely at what the people need. We need to look directly at what's happening around the country in different areas and see how we can be present in these different areas and make sure that people do have proper access to health care. And here I come back uh, and agree with you on the arguments that you presented. We need to see a whole health care itinerary where we start in a situation where we are supporting one another with solidarity and where we are working collectively. This is the political courage that's needed. This is the professional and economic courage that's needed too. So we'll come back to these various points. We'll talk about training, about organization, and about financing. Uh, now, as to training, I mean, uh, obviously, we're not doing things right. We think that is general medicine uh, that's uh, really, uh, that should be in uh, the driver's seat. I mean, it's, it's we have the general practitioner who really knows the family uh, up to the uh, great-grandfather. So. Uh, we, they, that general practitioner will be the one who will be who should be the one coordinating, and the specialist will disappear. Uh, now we have melanoma, which is uh, uh, de detected by machines. Uh, radiologists uh, are disappearing. Uh, surgeons are being replaced by robots, and so on. So uh, people who are practicing spe uh, specialty medicine will gradually disappear, and now we continue training them. You know, but. What are we going to do with them in about 10 years' time when we see how much we have changed and evolved in terms of uh, digital technology? What are we going to do with these people in 10 years' time? So I would like general medicine uh, faculties to be created in the suburbs where we're going to get, uh, we're going to go to uh, see those boys on the street and say, ask them, okay, do you want to be a nurse? Do you want to be a doctor? You're going to be trained for this. And they want to go there and they will then go back to the suburbs where nobody wants to practice. And uh, we were prepared to uh, have a 48 billion euro plan for the suburbs, but, but that's not what we need. We need to really be in close contact with the suburbs. And I would like the first general medicine university to be created for those who live in the Parisian suburbs, for instance, and then we'd have 50 students only, not 500 students, uh, you know, and they'd be trained to everything. That's the first thing. The second thing it has to do with the organization. I have two questions here. About 10 years ago, to, uh, I launched a health truck that was driven by the nurse. The nurse had been trained for a year, and she would uh, go to the most remote uh, villages. The, 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 the truck was a little camper, uh, uh, and uh, it was equipped with a satellite phone at, at the time, because uh, you, uh, and and there was a retinograph sending uh, the uh, images to the university hospital, and the nurses were trained to detect uh, breast cancers and a number of other things. The village was uh, informed. Uh, uh, the mayor of the village was informed. There was there was a, a bell which were ra that was rung in the village uh, to inform that the truck would come. But the uh, board, the medical board at the time, uh, forbid us to actually do this uh, because they thought that we had to have uh, trained medical doctors. Yeah, we had uh, created the omnibus uh, for, a, for a Parisian suburb that was also rejected by the uh, medical board. But uh, we're talking about a time where each of us contributed to more rigidity in the system. 
I think that today we have demonstrated that we are currently restructuring the way we do our job. We have demonstrated that uh, uh, we want to share professional skills. We have uh, done away with the primary and secondary practices uh, that we had uh, in the past. This no longer exists. Now we're talking about multi-site activity, which really means what, what it says, you know? It means that today we consider that we have a, a, an activity, a, a professional activity in which we are identified, and there's a traceability of this uh, activity in multi-sites, multiple sites. So, of course, if you look back 30 years ago, uh, you know, uh, I was brought uh, to the uh, uh, medical board because I had set up a collective practice, but that's the past. Today, the uh, institution is really looking at professional restructuration, restructuring. So we have to, con to stop thinking in terms of uh, uh, architectural type of organization of the healthcare system to move directly to the way where we can provide access to health care throughout the French territory. And I come back to the example that you gave. Uh, for, there's no reason for France today not to be able to give some answer in terms of proper response with regards to uh, access to health care. There's no objective reason to prevent this. The only reason is the lack of courage. Well, there is a practice which gets its inspiration from what you mentioned, uh, which is uh, advanced medicine from the uh, um, uh, health care centers uh, in one of the uh, French regions with the blessing of the uh, uh, medical board. And the doctors there uh, have a uh, vehicle where they can uh, do con consultations for general uh, medicine. The appointments are taken by the health uh, care uh, center and the people, the old people or people who have problems with mobility are therefore visited by the uh, doctor once a week from the uh, health care center. It's not always the same doctor, so there's actually a, a sharing of the activity, but we see that this is a way, one way, for a territory which is pretty large uh, with uh, uh, desertification, it's a way to uh, fight uh, against uh, the lack of doctors in small towns. The doctors are satisfied because they continue to have collective practice uh, in the main town of the, of the area. And the patients are satisfied, especially for those who suffer from uh, chronic condition, uh, because uh, once a week they, they, they are visited by the doctor. Uh, so uh, we see that the, this new theory to accept that there's not one single system for all of the territory, because that's one of the obstacles uh, to uh, actually coming up with the appropriate solutions. Uh, so uh, where you have something that is uh, too administratively, uh, too, too much of a burden from from the administrative standpoint. So we cannot have one single solution for everything. Uh, when we talk about medical deserts, it could be in the suburbs of large cities, or it could be in an area, in a rural or rural area, where we have very little de population density. But you have to have solutions that are differentiated depending on the territory. And uh, uh, to go back to the question that was raised, namely, how do we manage to reduce resistance to change? Well, I can see several possibilities. There, there is resistance to change, which is of a professional nature. In other words, the more senior doctors may be reluctant to adopt new ways of working, new practices. The new doctors do not want to have the same constraints as the old ones of the previous generations. And then there's also the issue of training, which uh, now has been finally has been delegated uh, with more internship uh, uh, for um, medical students, which is good because this means that the, the students later on will uh, set up shop. But uh, this uh, depletes uh, the, the staff in the local hospitals who no longer have their, their, their interns. So uh, it's a problem. Uh, so there are obstacles also within the population because a lot, uh, lots of French people have the no uh, nostalgia of the old village medical doctor who had, uh, uh, who, who was uh, very old-fashioned, you know, riding his horse from one village to the next. And then there are also institutional and administrative obstacles as well. 
Because we have to accept that different solutions can be implemented uh, depending on the type of territory we're talking about. Also, we have to fight the naive beliefs of some local elected officials who believe that the solution is just to give some premises. So they give out, uh, they hand out a, ho- a house or a building and they say, okay, now we need, a, uh, now we're going to have a health center here. But no, it doesn't work, you know, it never works. Either You had uh, several doctors who adhered to the project, uh, and then you can solve the the, uh, the uh, uh, building problem later on. But you first have to have a project with doctors. I mean, you don't get you don't attract doctors just because you have a building for them. Otherwise, you get a few uh, doctors who come from Romania who, is go- who are going to stay one or two years and then uh, who are going to leave afterwards. Um, Well, first of all, I'm say, I would like to say that things are moving ahead. Uh, there are positive developments. There are still a lot of resistance to change, but less so than two or three years ago. Let me give you something very concrete that we're faced with uh, on a daily basis. And here I'm only talking about telemedicine. I'm not talking about the other practices that could possibly be useful to uh, answer the question of uh, medical deserts. But, uh, for instance, the place where the doctor has his practice. Okay, you can ima- you can see that we uh, are trying to cure uh, French patients who live in the Philippines, you know, in a very transparent manner. Uh, and sometimes we have uh, the, the question about uh, one <laughs> French uh, doctor who's in one administrative uh, uh, department, uh, administrative province in France, and who would have to consult, uh, uh, who would consult with another administrative province. So this is ridiculous. The, the project has to be filed with the regional health uh, authority, which is very much hospital-centered. So whenever we proposed some access to care in territories where there was no hospital, usually we never got an answer. And there were some projects which uh, went on, you know, being uh, uh, looked at for four, three years, three, four years, without the authorization being granted. The third problem that we also encounter on a daily basis, because you actually were asking about the, the obstacles, so I would like to tell you what we're faced with on a daily basis, is the fact that we have two parallel worlds here. We have that of the administration, the uh, uh, regional health uh, agencies, uh, but, but they're also very proactive sometimes. They pro- propose a lot of things. And that of the elected officials and patient associations. And very often, they, they don't meet, you know. We have mapping, which is completely different. The mayor would say, okay, I I'm telling you that every weekend there are some problems for uh, the people in my town to have access to a doctor. And then you have uh, the regional health authority who say, no, 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 you cannot uh, set up shop there because there's no problem. You know, so those are very concrete problems. But uh, I think it's necessary that we discuss this because if we don't solve these problems, we're going to continue experimenting. uh, uh, And I think that the the political will today is really to try and go a little bit further than this. And, and, And And there are obstacles that we have to face on a daily basis, certainly. No, I I would like only to say that uh, beyond not having doctors in some places, uh, the question of training is also very important because sometimes you have a medical doctor, but he's not well trained and he does not have, or he or she does not have compromise with the, the, the primary healthcare team. And uh, so these medical deserts probably are larger than we, we, we are seeing when you see only there is a doctor here. But sometimes, at least in Brazil, imagine that in France also. Uh, it does not matter so much because the medical doctor goes there only to, to fill the, 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 the position. It's not coordinating the care with the healthcare team and doing the, all the preventive and therapeutic Uh, actions that they could do in this territory. So I think that this problem problem is is wider or larger than we we expect. Only not having a medical doctor there, but the, me- the medical being there and not being there as we expect as a leader of the health uh, team or one of the leaders of the health team of this 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 region. And I think that telehealth for this issue is also very positive because it's a way of uh, getting contact with this medical doctor by teleconsultations, doing telediagnosis, and doing things that they are not able to, to do. And also, uh, 
reducing this sensation of isolation, of not, not, not being seen for, for, from other persons. And so I think that maybe that to connect these doctors and these health professionals with others, using telehealth in other, other means, they are very, very positive for, for this. And training is an important issue, but training should be well tailored for their needs. So I think that this I mean, should be... Uh, the, the, the stakeholders have to think about this in a very, comp very wide way of uh, improving the, the health, improving the presence, but also the quality of the medical that's working there. Oui. Je, je sur mon dada qui est yes, I would like to come back to what I uh, particularly like uh, discussing, namely uh, the digital uh, cover, coverage. I mean, in France, uh, uh, we are very far from the 98%, which is announced by the telcos, uh, uh, because we can't, I mean, the, the, this, this data, the penetration rate of 98% uh, is announced, but we can control it. Uh, in Senegal, we have an 80% uh, uh, penetration rate. Uh, and there are data that were given uh, to us uh, last year where we saw that there were some parts of Africa where it was easier to have access to a mobile uh, telephone network than to uh, running and, and to drinking water. But in France, it's the other way around, you see. Okay, so uh, there's no... Uh, necessarily vocational training uh, that is provided uh, for to the medical doctors. You can't keep up to date. And therefore, it's very difficult as a, as a local practitioner. It's a, uh, or, or you have to use very rudimentary resources to consult with a, a specialist or with a friend or a colleague. My best friend lives in Brazil, and he always asks me to do Skype with him or WhatsApp, but I, I don't have enough connection. And he says... Well, what are you doing in France? And I say, well, sorry, we're in 2018 and we don't have enough connection. Well, there, there was a three billion plan which is, was negotiated with the telcos. Uh, yeah, but there, there's a problem with the broadband. Um, there's a broadband issue. There's a problem with uh, um, installing the antennas. Well, on the from the organizational standpoint, I fully agree with you. I think we should have little uh, local platforms or hubs, uh, healthcare hubs, that uh, would be open for a long period of time. You know, including the, in the evenings, uh, and uh, uh, from there, uh, a nurse or other health professionals could uh, go and visit uh, other the village the surrounding villages uh, with uh, their, uh, with a truck that would be put at their disposal, or or maybe you could have the uh, mail service uh, um, van, delivery vans that could be put at their disposal, whatever, and and uh, all of the uh, uh, all of this data would then be sent to a healthcare center, and there would be a, co a cooperation effort. Well, I have a practical example that I can give you, uh, which uh, certainly uh, you, that we, that you might like. Uh, I am. Uh, corresponding uh, doctor for uh, the emergency medical assistance service. Uh, uh, it was uh, in an e on an evening at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, the the uh, doctor from uh, uh, the uh, emergency medical assistance uh, uh, service called me, said, okay, I, there was a woman who called me. Uh, she had pain in her chest, uh, but now I tried to call her back, and uh, uh, I couldn't get in touch with her. So uh, she's located here and there. So I went to that person to see that person. She still had chest pain, but, but she could no longer talk on the telephone because there was no connection anymore. So uh, firstly, the, 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 the thing is, uh, she didn't get any proper connection, uh, so she had to move away from her home. She had to walk 100 meters before she could actually get a proper connection. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this is what, what she did to call. And she said, okay, I have a landline, but uh, it's been uh, down for a month, and France Telecom hasn't uh, uh, visited me to uh, maintain it. So, uh, well, she was having a, a myocardial infarction. There, it was all very uh, clear on the ECG, uh, so I made a picture of the ECG. I wanted to uh, send this, uh, 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 remotely send it to the uh, 
uh, emergency medical assistance service. I had to walk 100 meters to do this. Uh, and so the medical doctor at the emergency medical assistance service said, OK, we're going to send the helicopter. Uh, but it was already 9 PM. And uh, in that region, it was uh, not possible to get in touch with the helicopter. OK, so I did the usual cocktail of Lovinox, uh, Aspigic, and so on. Uh, and uh, after two hours, we were still waiting for the chopper. And the chopper couldn't get through. So we said, OK, we will uh, ask uh, for a vehicle from the uh, emergency medical service. Uh, the vehicle came. We went all the way to the uh, larger city in the area. Then finally, still, there was still no helicopter. We got to Montpellier. Uh, Montpellier, uh, we got there at midnight. Uh, she had a thrombolysis uh, done. And the next day, was, she was feeling better. But, but you see, we have a medical desert there. I mean, obviously, because, you know, 100 meters away, she doesn't get any connection, you know, and she cannot talk to the the the, the, the operators. So, uh, and I left uh, home at about uh, eight, uh, and uh, I came back home at midnight. But in the end, it worked. But but that's yeah, that's a very telling example. And also, there's the example of the Molen Islands, which is off the uh, coast of Brittany, where there are huge winds and uh, huge waves. There's no medical doctor there. There's just one who comes uh, once a week in the in the winter. Uh, uh, and what, what do we have there? We have a nurse uh, who's there, and uh, he has uh, drugs that he can uh, prescribe, and, and, and he's uh, in contact with the medical doctors. And we never saw the uh, inhabitants of this island, you know, demonstrating to ask for a, a doctor. So uh, it, it's, uh, you know, sometimes when the conditions are very hard, people don't complain. <laughs> so I would like to know about the, the foreign experience in this area. Uh, what kind of organization uh, would you think? think it would be good to actually meet these challenges. Would you have any comments to make on what was just said? Albert Claude Benamou, there is one issue, and I'm, I'm a surgeon. There is one topic you haven't addressed. So you're a surgeon, so am I. We haven't talked about surgical deserts where there is no first-line surgical service or even specialized surgery. And just to top up on what the uh, chairman of the uh, medical association said, you said that there's a lack of political will or political courage. That's true. But let's think about why that courage is lacking. It's because often doctors are very conservative, uh, some professionals are very conservative, do not want people tinkering with their system. That's where they got their training. It's how they get their livelihood. So they don't want anybody interfering. So I think that there has to be increased awareness about what we ourselves can do and should be doing to adjust to the changes that are ongoing. And another comment or question, please. Yes, I have a question for our Brazilian friend. You heard this whole debate amongst French people, some comments made uh, from people representing institutions or uh, healthcare professionals or patients. I'd like to ask you, in the system that you uh, set up, when it was set up, of course, you know, you're a much larger country with bigger distances, but did you meet up with the same kinds of difficulties or obstacles? And if so, how did you overcome them? How did you solve the problem to enable everybody to cooperate together? Uh, because I think that's what we should be talking about today, looking at how you can move from a difficult situation and implement practical solutions to get everybody to work together. Oh, um, I think that probably we have a, a different situation because you have uh, uh, much less resources than, than you have. Uh, a slide was presented here uh, earlier showing the number of medical doctors, the number of beds in Latin America, uh, Africa, and Europe from, for our patients. So uh, this is a problem, but somehow this is also uh, a push, uh, something that can lead to, to new solutions to be accepted more easily because if you have less uh, new solutions sometimes are, are more well received. Uh, we have uh, 
we have problems. Uh, cities, now cities without doctors in Brazil is it's not so common. Brazil has a, a strong policy to try to, trying to provide, uh, at least in Minas Gerais state, it's very uncommon. In the north of the, the country, in the Amazonian region, it's, it's, mm -hmm. much, it's much more country. But, uh, so these innovations are, are being relatively well accepted, but it's, this is not uniform. For example, mm -hmm. the, the decision support system for high blood pressure and diabetes. We have doctors that are working with it, they collaborate a lot, they use the notebook or the, the tablet, they have different versions, uh, but they are doc doctors that do, do not want to use it. And they are refusing, they are not uh, doing the consultations inside the system. And I think that the problem is no, no, it's not very different from this kind of uh, resistance that you have here and elsewhere. Uh, the first issue is so we have much more need, so maybe new solutions are more well received. Uh, we have much higher needs in terms of uh, ambulances and systems and hospital beds. And I think that maybe what we are saying about a threshold that is it's a little higher in France than in Brazil, is certainly in, in African countries. Uh, and I think that we, we accept task sharing probably a little more than you. It's more establishing the Brazilian culture that we will share tasks with the pharmacists and the nurses, and, and maybe the population also is more well prepared to be uh, cared by by people from the, from other other fields in a collaborative uh, work, mm -hmm. but I, I cannot say that we are. I think that we maybe we considering all these needs, the, the, these new tools are being well well received in in most Brazilian places. But uh, probably when when you consider the the whole, I'm sure that the, the situation in France is much better than in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Alors on voit bien que, en fait, plus les pays sont développés économiquement et plus ils sont organisés au point de vue sanitaire, plus il est difficile so, de changer uh, le you know, the better established the system in a, in a country, with the more resources, the more difficult it is to change. Kenneth Kaiser completely revisited, revamped the veteran system in the 80s in the U.S., which manages about 9 million veterans plus their families. That's about 25 or 30 million people with hundreds of hospitals, etc. And he laid off 10 percent of those doctors who did not want to uh, progress and evolve along with a new system. We just can't envision that happening in France. It, some kind of authority telling doctors you either uh, jump on the bandwagon or you'll be out. But you wanted to say something. I got my microphone to work. Yes, it is true that there's a French idiosyncrasy or perhaps a Western European idiosyncrasy to make things overcomplicated. And we tend to lose sight of uh, the uh, first priority, which is to treat to treat. A doctor will have a patient on the phone, will want to uh, deal with the issue over the phone or uh, in the doctor's office. So, you know, we've forgotten that our main mission is to go out and treat people. We try and make things overcomplicated. So, Will artificial intelligence take away my uh, power to decide whether I should uh, unplug someone from a machine or not? We're forgetting about our uh, Hippocrates' oath. We're already you know, forgetting about our mission to treat. There are uh, areas where uh, people are underserved and where they die. Yes, and this brings us to the issue of evaluation. Uh, politicians put millions and billions on the table, and we don't know how whether that has an impact. You know, there's there are no impact studies, no follow-up studies. And researchers, as you know, are graded or scored 
scored based on what they publish. And if you actually want to practice instead of write or do research, you don't exist. I remember a health center, 1,500 square meters, uh, lots of doctors with a head, uh, top clinician, top researcher. What does she do? She conducts micro studies in a catchment area of 20,000 people in order to exist. And in Minas Gerais, what do you do? You evaluate the impact of the money that was put on the table and the new system. Is that not right? Yes, I, I really think that the solution not only from Brazil or France is, is not to abandon the basic research, the traditional translational research, but trying to improve the methods we, we have to document uh, improvement in clinical practice, improvement of results based in uh, health policies and, and practice that are being uh, introduced. I think that uh, we, we had great improvements in genomics, in epidemiology, in many, many fields, but I think that it's now time to understand that it's not possible to conduct a randomized clinical trial. You, you should have to do a cluster randomized trial that's much more complex, or to use observational methods that use administrative data to evaluate impact. So I think there is a lot of room of improvement in the methodology, but also in the schools of medicine, the academy of medicine, to a kind of research that is based in, in the clinical practice, in what's happening on the field, not inside the laboratories, or even at the bedside in, in the medical wards. I really think that uh, this is a, the, the big challenge, and I, I truly believe that uh, many important changes will be with incorporating this, this kind of research and uh, giving value to it, so to accepting them in good journals and, uh, and considering that they are as important as basic research as a clinical uh, bedside oui. research. Oui. Je pense que vous touchez là un point fondamental qui est, est l'évaluation. Ce n'est pas une tradition ancienne en France, mais c'est quelque chose I think you're touching upon evaluation. Evaluation, monitoring and assessment is not necessarily a tradition in France, but slowly that methodology is being picked up by our regional health authorities. The evaluation process is starting to be uh, accepted, but we still see a lot of reluctance and resistance on the part of our fellow, some of our fellow doctors, because they see it as hindering their freedom to prescribe, their freedom to do what they want, and they feel that it runs counter to what they should be doing, even when what they do is, runs contrary to. Uh, health authority recommendations, best practices, etc. So all of us, even those who are the better doctors, we all need to be evaluated to check our performance. And there are huge things at stake. 30% of procedures in France are not relevant. Since they're not relevant, they cost money for nothing. They use up doctor time for nothing. And this may lead patients to developing huge complications because sometimes you know these are um, irrelevant invasive procedures that are damaging to patients. And how can we identify them? Is to accept evaluation. Doesn't mean there's going to be you know a big bad policeman standing behind every single doctor. Not at all. It should be an accepted procedure amongst peers with the fact of accepting guidance and recommendations from respected doctors uh, with a view to improving the uh, medical service rendered and improving results for the good of patients. Well, when you look at our health system, when you look at it from the prism of uh, uh, education, uh, territorial organization uh, funding, 
whichever thread you pull on, you see that all of this is interlinked. So let's talk about money. How are we going to fund? Where, where's the money going to come from for uh, modernization of facilities, but also modernization of training? Uh, there have been initiatives proposed by the French Medical Association in Minas Gerais. Perhaps you had incentives to bring doctors on board? Well, you know, to find the funding, you have to know what you're funding and whether what you're funding is useful and relevant. I wrote a book which came out on May 2nd. It includes a study. Do you know how many in France, how many health experiments take place on the basis of laws, some of which are uh, older than 30 years old, 715 715, 715 protocols, experimentation protocols that have practically become chronic, i.e. they keep going on and on, they lead to no decisions, they cost billions of euros. And that's an entire culture, a way of never having to make a clear-cut decision and uh, continuing to fund experiments. You know, experimentation is a process, a process that should lead to proving or disproving a theory that you can then apply or discuss. But there are huge sums, huge amounts of money put on the table that uh, fund models, organizations, uh, uh, facilities that are very costly and are never evaluated in uh, terms of their performance or their results. And uh, you can't, therefore, even save by streamlining procedures or looking at the direct cost of things. Streamlining is always dangerous. You have to rethink the entire funding system and the way the whole system is funded, which leads us to another question, and it ties in with the one you were asking. How is the health sector funded in France? It goes back to the laws of 1945, uh, after the Second World War, when we set up a welfare system, uh, which is how the system developed. And it was meant to help the system develop. Do we accept public funding? funding, i.e. that's what France does, it's central government that should invest, or should the funding take place or come from uh, the stakeholders in the system based on contracts, on specific goals, and nobody ever addresses this. Nobody ever uh, takes time to think about what the system should be. And that's exactly the kind of discussion that we need. There needs to be, there need to be more clear definitions. You're absolutely right. And what we see in France is that when you try to experiment something and when you show proof, people say, that's great, but you know, it's, it's because of your team. Your team is great. This is not reproducible. But should we all be doing and achieving the same thing from uh, the uh, north to the south of France, from east to west? And I'm sure that if we delegated to our regions, I'd like to hear a Brazilian friend on this, if we devolved 75% to the regional authorities and kept the 25% for the uh, major uh, public health issues like cancer, etc. Things would work well. But that's not what politicians say. They say it's going to be uh, wasted. I think that regional devol devolution is the best. Do you do that in Minas Gerais or is the health budget centralized? So uh, in, in Brazil, we have a very, everywhere, I imagine, a very complex uh, health uh, system. We have a three-part system. There is some duties on the, res on the uh, responsibility of the national authority, uh, some from the state, and many of them for the cities. Uh, the cities, they receive an amount of money per capita per, per person uh, for the primary health care and other activities of prevention and so on. So uh, these cities, they have some agreement with the other cities in the region for 
forwarding the patients for specialized care, for surgery, and so on. So uh, these three parts, they have to put at least 10% of his, their budget, but they frequently they do not do this. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very complex system. The public health system is universal, as in France, but it's responsible only for 70% of the care, there, there are health plans and uh, private plans that are responsible for the, the other part, and they have much more money because they get money from the people who, from their income, from the companies and, and so. So we have these two systems that are in, in parallel. Uh, there is no uh, central money that was uh, returned for the state. Uh, the, you have a, a money from the national government who is sent for cities, and the state has to spend part of this money in, in health. I, I would be very happy to say that it works very well, but I'm sad to say that it's not, it's not as good as we expect. It's a, it's a, we are really underfunded when we consider the amount of money we spend per capita in comparison with European countries, we spend much less. Uh, and we have good results in some fields and uh, in some measures like uh, smoking, uh, HIV, and, and several conditions. But when you consider the efficiency of the system as a whole, I, I cannot say that the Brazilian system is uh, more well fitted, more well organized, probably is less than, than the, the, the French system. We try to establish a very rational and good system of uh, evaluating the new things, how to include things. We have a national role of procedures and drugs, and we have a national commission that evaluates the eff effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of each new uh, treatment for cancer, for example, for uh, it's the, the most important. And it would be very, very interesting, but something went wrong in this last 10 years because uh, money went short. And even important things that should be included in the role were not included. So when the, this gate is closed for one side, the other gate is opened by the judge, by the law. And the patients enter injustice and ask for medications or treatments that are, they are not proven, they are, can give benefit. And they can obtain these treatments by uh, a, 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 a order of the, the judge. So this issue that's, I think, in the past was much more an American issue, now in Brazil became, because in Brazil, health is a right of the person by the Constitution. So, oh, health is a health, it's, a, it's my right, it's written in the, the, the Brazilian Constitution, so I can ask for something that uh, has three cases in the world that work it, and sometimes the judge can, can, can give in the the mind of judges, uh, mind of judges, we, do, we never know what it's inside. So uh, we, we, we have many, many problems. Maybe uh, this universal system is well, well sought, but the, the day by day uh, way that things working are, are not so good as we expected. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to say two things on this. First of all, we're talking about the priority that we have in France, namely for a mayor, the priority is to build a healthcare center. Uh, I have an example uh, of a center that was uh, built. Uh, okay, the idea was wonderful, so we, we built a, a building, and then we realized there were more researchers than originally planned, so we, we uh, extended the building. But in the, in the US, you know, you, you start by thinking about the idea, and then you have the proper structure constructed. Uh, here in France, we build a building uh, without uh, consulting with a physiotherapist, without uh, having necessarily uh, the internet access, whatever. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, you get something that's completely inadequate. And here we are in an international meeting, and I really like this. 
this, and now you are presenting slides uh, with figures uh, with a return on investment. Uh, uh, but it's not possible in a French meeting when you talk about health. It's just not possible to give uh, figures and talk about return on investment in health care. You, you never get an ROI figure in for, for the French health care system. So uh, that's why I, I thought it was it was really great, you know, to see that uh, sometimes this is assessed, uh, assessed in a completely different way. Yes, well, as to funding, we all know that there is a question mark for the future. And uh, we have a legitimate uh, wish in France to uh, provide equal access to, to health care, including the most costly type of uh, health care for all French people, whatever their uh, level of resources. Of course, with the aging of population, with the uh, uh, increased performance to deal with very rare diseases, it's a, it's a bigger challenge. But there are ways, interesting ways to deal with this. First of all, there are not that many uh, countries uh, that have two different uh, financing streams. Uh, first of all, you have the uh, the health uh, the, the health authority, and you also have the state. So uh, uh, the, the the two different flows of, fi of funding, and it's not really necessarily the most efficient way to deal with this. That's the first thing. Third, secondly, 30 percent of the procedures uh, are uh, irrelevant. Uh, as I mentioned before. Thirdly, uh, there is the, the problem with the local dimension. The, of course, uh, deciding centrally how uh, everything is going to be organized and funded and everywhere in France. I mean, this is obviously completely, I mean, really difficult in, in France, and it's even more difficult when you're ta not talking about metropolitan France, but elsewhere in the world. So, uh, of course, the, the, there's a problem there. Also, and this is a very common rule. I mean, uh, in, uh, health professionals have to be rewarded, you know, uh, when they use the resources better. They have to be rewarded in a way, in some way, you know, uh, one way or the other. So maybe uh, the, the savings generated could help us uh, develop the most relevant actions. Otherwise, we're going to continue investing large sums of money in activities that do not provide added value from the medical standpoint. And we're going to re continue reimbursing things uh, that could be challenged, really challengeable. So, I mean, we have these resources lying there, but of course, of course, uh, uh, there, there would be, we would be ruffling a few feathers, you know, if we were to uh, do things properly. Uh, and uh, another thing is we have to uh, move away from a purely uh, curative system. We have to look at health care in general. And of course, there should be much more done in terms of funding prevention. So long as we don't have uh, 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 health, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, health authority. I mean, we, we call it a, the a disease um, uh, funding agency, uh, but actually uh, it should be called a health care uh, funding agency uh, because uh, obviously then in that way we could start uh, working on prevention. Uh, for instance, we saw the, the, the results uh, obtained when uh, we, were, uh, we went to the uh, 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 stop smoking campaign. So whenever you invest Best there, the benefit is, is obvious uh, and immediate, but the uh, funding agency, uh, the traditional funding agency, does not look into the benefits of prevention. And so, here again, uh, we have this uh, silo segmentation, which uh, prevents us from being really efficient uh, overall. And then the other thing is the data. Uh, we are sitting on a huge mass of data, but we don't take advantage of it. And from these data, of course, we could devise a number of rules uh, that would allow us to be as efficient as possible in terms of investment, in terms of the implementation of a number of procedures that would be uh, more relevant and more uh, efficient. For the moment, there are still obstacles to sharing the data. To, there are questions uh, relating, of course, to the need. Uh, 
preserving confidentiality, uh, the utmost confidentiality of these data, which is obvious to everyone. But whenever we're talking about a more efficient system for tomorrow, we should be in a position to use these data. And for the moment, it's very difficult. So in theory, I think we could really develop a more efficient system from the uh, financial or funding resources standpoint, better than what we said before. I hope uh, that Parliament is going to move in that direction. Uh, well, no, no, no. I mean, we, we, we could uh, uh, make uh, laws, uh, but uh, we do uh, we not be executive uh, with the legislative uh, organ. Yes, but uh, it's as if, you know, the referee at some point in a, in a soccer game would uh, grab the ball and, and, and uh, score a goal. Uh, so, uh, we have the, 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 the French state who's uh, just uh, not uh, involved enough. Uh, and so we really have to aux oasis uh, de santé from on medical les, deserts to uh, uh, health uh, oasis uh, uh, and then you will have the patients coming we will water them and they will have the well in the center of the oasis and, and things will be will be better i would like to ask you one last question and then we're going to have questions from the room the uh, uh, president arrives here, and you have uh, uh, three words that you want to tell the president of the French Republic. You know, he's coming here, he's going to come here, he's going to shake your hands. Now, are there three words that you would like to say to him so as to transform these deserts and turn these deserts into oasis? But in the meantime, I'll take questions from the room. I think this is a very interesting discussion. I would like to thank those who organized it. And uh, there's just one general practitioner uh, here. Oh, no, two, two of them. Two GPs here around the table. Okay, but uh, we have the best, the most beautiful job in the world. Uh, uh, I'm a specialist, uh, so things are uh, easier for us. Uh, in general uh, medicine, it's more difficult, but we have to stop tramping on, on it. Uh, recently, there were uh, questions relating to the functioning of the emergency uh, medical assistance service, and the uh, answer was, give us more resources. Uh, give us more resources, uh, give us, give the hospitals more resources, forgetting that it would have been better to have a family doctor present or close by to give an answer. So let's uh, uh, stop tramping on, the, uh, on general medicine. Uh, our country should uh, give young people the, the desire to actually go and settle in the, in the rural areas. You know, let's uh, give an example here. I could go very often to Quebec. I love that country and uh, medical deserts are a reality there. And one of the solutions that was suggested is uh, and you're going to be shocked by this, is that in order for uh, doctors to be on standby, uh, they would be paid $500,000 a year so that there's no medical desert left. And in the end, it'll cost less to society at large. You know, why is it uh, uh, that there's no doctor left in my uh, uh, region? Well, because society has not recognized properly the, the uh, isolated, difficult work performed by those GPs. They should be consider considered as different doctors from the other, and they have to be paid properly. Yes, I'm fully convinced with this. I fully agree with you. Uh, the, the general uh, uh, practitioner is uh, uh, the, 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 at the heart of all this, and it's very difficult to get this message across. But this is where we really have to, 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 to fight. Well, to uh, answer my uh, colleague, uh, I'm a former uh, intern doctor, but I've been inter interested in in uh, um, general medicine uh, in the academy, we set up a, a commission to promote general medicine so that it could benefit from the best possible uh, conditions. But I would like to uh, come back to this issue of medical deserts. First of all, that phrase is uh, weird because here we actually are bringing together two things that are completely different. 
has nothing to do with Minas Gerais, for instance, where you said there were uh, 21 million inhabitants for 700,000 uh, square kilometers. And, and uh, uh, in, in this, uh, on this vast territory, there, there are anomalies uh, where you have uh, big towns and you also have sometimes a very, very low population density, three people per uh, square kilometer. But in French, in France, what does it mean when we talk about medical deserts? Well, sorry, sorry, dear colleague, but please ask, ask your question, because we don't have that much time. Well, the question is, I don't think we can have a general solution. We always have to look at what's happening in the field, locally. Uh, uh, we should talk about geography. We should talk about uh, uh, what's happening locally. Now, if we're looking for a one-size-fits-all solution, we are going to fail. We really have to talk about the different geographies. That's very, very important. Well, sorry, two people are speaking at the same time. It's very difficult for the interpreter. Well, dear colleague, I'm sorry, I have to stop you there because, uh, okay, could you be, please ask your question? Well, I would like to congratulate the uh, panelists. Uh, they're very competent, uh, highly comp competent people. But I have a question, really. I'm asking myself a question. I have the feeling that we are giving a bad impression uh, to our uh, foreign friends because they have medical deserts because they don't have the human resources or the financial resources. And they think, okay, we have medical deserts even though we have human resources and financial resources. Don't you think this is a really paradoxical? Of course, yes, is the answer. Okay, so Mr. Macron is here, you know. I'm going to play Mr. Macron. I'm shaking your hand, okay, and I want you to say three words. Uh, okay, we have to organize uh, healthcare around general medicine, asking for the general practitioners to look into prevention as well. Secondly, we have to uh, uh, raise the difference between uh, facilities, general medicine. And thirdly, we have to have healthcare democracy, in other words, uh, be patient centric, uh, so that we should listen more to the patient because the patient has proposals to make. So. He's not my president, so it's, it's, it's easy. But if I was a French person, please go forward to primary health care, the family uh, health team, not only physicians. Please evaluate the results, do implementation research, evaluate the cost, cost effectiveness of every, every action. And as said, be open to new technologies, new options, new alternatives. Well, I'm a patient myself, so I, I would say uh, we should uh, uh, take away the guilt felt by the rural people, you know. They pay as much money as all of the urban dwellers, and so uh, they should not feel any guilt living there. The second thing is that uh, general medicine is the best specialty, and uh, if uh, people who want to go for specialty go in, on in internship, they realize that uh, they won't just be uh, um, uh, practicing their specialty but something else, and that's very good. And so we have to talk about the uh, health care budget, but we also have to talk about the uh, uh, national health system budget. Uh, and then we talk about, we talk about, we talk about, we, we speak of a medical, uh, military you know, defense budget, but we talk about the expense of the health care system. Uh, well, let's continue continue the reforms uh, that we need. Sen secondly, let's continue simplifying the red tape. That's really fundamental. And thirdly, invest locally as much as we can. Very good. Maybe we could have a small booth, uh, you know, a small telemedicine booth in the Elysee Palace uh, for the president. Well, think in terms of investment. Let's have a real local um, management of the patient. Uh, uh, let's decentralize. Let's be innovative. innovative. 
Perfect. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, what I would like uh, as a telemedicine uh, medical doctor is for what I'm doing to be recognized. I would like the funding uh, uh, for this, and I would like to work in a, um, an expanded team. Here you have a shadow cabinet on stage for you.